So I am uh, Dr. G. Sarangapani, Professor, Civil Engineering Department, the National Staff Engineering, Mysore. So I will be handling the course 10 CV 52, the design of RCC structural elements. Uh, this is a continuation course. The first uh, seven classes has been handled by my colleague Dr. G. S. Suresh. So here afterwards for another eight sessions I am going to cover this particular subject. Already these things have been discussed, the contents of the course which has got two parts, part A and part B. In part A, unit 1 and unit 2 has been covered in these seven days by Dr. G. S. Suresh. Now unit 3 and unit 4 is going to be covered by myself that is regarding the flexure and serviceability limit states and the design of beams. Part B it will be covered by my colleagues Professor Nadraj, GPC and Raviraj <coughs> where they will be dealing with the actual design of the different uh, structural elements, the design of slabs, the design of columns, the design of footings and the design of staircases. Regarding the scheme of examination, there will be one question from each unit. So from unit 1 to 4, there will be 4 questions. Again from unit 5 to 8, there will be 4 questions. So first 2 questions have been already covered, that is the question coming from unit 1 and unit 2, whereas I am going to cover the questions that are going to appear from unit 3 and unit 4. And uh, there will be totally 8 questions out of which you have to answer 5 questions, selecting at least 2 from each part. Regarding the reference books, there are several reference books, especially in this particular subject. If you want to thoroughly know the subject, you have to refer the book like Varghese, Limit State Design of Reinforced Concrete by P. C. Varghese and other authors which I have listed here. In addition to this, you should have this Bureau of Indian Standards publications that is the IS 456 2000 and SP 16. The IS 456 2000 is the guideline for the design of RC elements. SP 16 is another special special publication for this SP uh, for this IS 456. Um, first of all, I would like to review whatever Dr. Suresh has done so far. So in this, he has covered how to take the design loads in the first few classes. You very well know that there are three kinds of loads: that is the dead load, live load, and the lateral loads. The dead load is calculated based on the density. You also know that the density of concrete as 25 kilo Newton per meter cube. Suppose there is a wall on any element, then the dead load of the wall has to be considered. Again this dead load realized because of the wall is going to be calculated based on the density. The density of different materials have been already told by Dr. G. S. Suresh. Then whatever the loads that get realized has to be multiplied by the factored load, multiplied by the partial safety factor to get the design loads. And regarding the materials, that is the common materials, the concrete and uh, the commonly, the most commonly used materials, the concrete and steel has also been dealt by Dr. G. S. Suresh. So now I am going to just go through whatever he has covered so far in another 2 or 3 minutes. So next he has covered something about the code requirements, the design philosophy where he has mentioned about the two different methods of design, the working stress method and the limit state method. The working stress method is obsolete, nobody uses that method. However, still till today for the design of water tanks, one has to refer or one has to use this working stress method. 
the IS-3370 part 1 to part 4 covers about the design of water tanks where the working stress method is used. Next he might have covered, he has also covered the limit state method of design and whatever the design which we are going to learn here in this course is based on the limit state method of design. Then further the design principles, the philosophy of limit state, the characteristic values, all these things have been already discussed. In the second part of his lecture, he has covered the stress block parameters, the values of K1 and K2 has been derived and further the shear strength, the flexural strength, the torsional strength, the bond and anchorage has also been covered by Dr. G. S. Suresh. And in the last part of his course, last part of his course he has dealt with the analysis problems of singly reinforced beams, doubly reinforced beams and flanger sections. So, you very well know the meaning of all these SRS, DRS and flanger sections. With this background, I am now going to tell you about the portions I am going to cover. First of all, I am going to start with this definition of beams. I am going to make you to understand a beam and later I am going to discuss about the different types of beams. The general specifications and practical requirements which are necessary for the design of beams are going to be discussed. Unless you know the general specifications and practical requirements, one cannot design the beams. Then the third part consists of discussion about the general aspects of serviceability, where we are going to use the serviceability requirements and the limit state of collapse etcetera for the design of beams. Then finally, I am going to work out some problems on this design of beams. So, this is uh, going to be covered in another 8 hours which has been allotted to me. That will be the end of this part A. By the time uh, we complete part A, you will be able to design any type of beam subjected to any kind of loading. So, the objective of uh, the today's class. Now, let us come to the today's class where I am going to cover the general specification for flexure design and the practical requirements for the design of beams. So, the objective of the today's course is to understand the general specifications for flexure design and practical requirements for the design of beams. So, the syllabus says the unit 3 of your syllabus clearly mentions the heading as flexure and serviceability limit states. So, even though you very well know the meaning of this limit state, once again I am going to just go through the definition of limit state because it is very important for my further deliberations. When the structure or part of a structure becomes unfit for use, we say that it has reached its limit state. The unfitness can arise because of several reasons. The excessive deflections, the cracking which causes discomfort of the users also is a part of the unfitness. So, the unfitness need not be always collapse, it may be excessive deflections, excessive cracking and several other reasons are there to make a structure unfit. So, the moment a structure reaches a state where it becomes unfit for use, we say that it has reached its limit state. For everything there is a limit. So, the structure has also got some limits regarding the load carrying capacity and durability etcetera. So, we will not allow any of our structure to go beyond this limit state. So, this is about the definition of the limit state. Coming to the different types of limit states, there are several lim 
limit states, but as far as the beam is concerned we are going to deal with the limit state of collapse and the limit state of serviceability. The limit state of collapse is concerned with the load carrying capacity of the structure, the strength the structure has got that represents the limit state of collapse. This limit state of collapse may be because of rupture, rupture you very well know that if there is a split then we call it as a rupture. Then buckling, a buckling may also cause a structure to collapse, a long column when subjected to eccentric loading like this it may buckle and it may fail. So, buckling is also an important thing which causes or which makes the structure to attain the limit state of collapse. And we have the overturning, overturning is the whole thing may overturn, the rigid body movement may occur. So, this is also responsible or this overturning also causes the collapse of the structure. The whole structure may be intact, but there may be a rigid body movement like as I am showing here, the whole thing may overturn like this, then this also induces or makes the structure to reach its limit state of collapse. Further the sliding, whenever there is any lateral load, the whole thing may slide. This happens when the frictional resistance offered at the common surface of contact is lesser than the lateral load that is acting. So, the limit state of collapse occurs because of rupture, buckling, overturning and sliding. So, the structure may be very good as far as the strength is concerned, but still it has to satisfy the limit state of serviceability. Serviceability is very important, suppose you buy any goods, any item you buy then you may not be satisfied only with the strength of the item or strength of the material, you may also be worried about the serviceability requirements. As far as the structures are concerned, the deflection and cracking are the two important things which comes under this limit state of serviceability. The structure should not have excessive deflections, it should not have excessive cracking. So, a structure is normally designed for the limit state of collapse and then further checked for the limit state of serviceability like deflection and cracking. So, let us come back to this definition of beams. A beam is any member, a structural member which supports transfer slots. Let us take a building here like this. In this building, let us take the span of or one of the dimensions, let us take it as 8 meters. In the other direction, let us consider this dimension as 30 meters. Now, the question is, let us assume that there is a masonry wall on all the four sides. Can I support or can I have only one slab on this building? Yeah, we can have only one slab on this building, whatever the load that is getting realized on the slab as well as the self head of the slab gets transferred to these walls. But when you design this huge slab, you are going to get a very large thickness of the slab where there will be enormous self weight and it is not advisable to have a large or thick slab. So, therefore, what we normally do is we provide the beams, so that the slab is provided in three panels or any convenient number of panels. For example, in this 30 meter we may provide around 10 beams like this, so that each span, each bay is around 3 meters. I am not able to show all the 10 beams here, but anyhow this whole slab has been divided into several panels, each panel being around 3 meter length. So, like that there are several beams here and this is a typical beam that is normally provided in a building. So, basically a beam 
consists of or a beam supports the transverse load. For example, if I just write the longitudinal section of any beam like this, the load will be acting on this beam. Whatever the load that acts on the slab gets transferred to the beam and a beam basically supports transverse loads. Transverse loads are the loads which are perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the beam. So, these transverse loads on the beam causes bending moment and shear force. Bending moment and shear force develops in any beam. So, a beam is basically a flexural member subjected to bending moment as well as shear force. For example, if I take this simply supported beam with uniformly distributed load, let us say that there is a load of W kilo Newton per meter run. If it is simply supported and if it is subjected to uniformly distributed load, the bending moment varies as a parabola, the maximum bending moment being W L square by 8 at the center. So, from this figure you can clearly understand that the beam is subjected to bending moment at a very cross section, except at the supports where the values of the bending moment is 0. Now, for the same beam one can also plot the shear force. So, whatever the load that is acting there is going to cause the shear and this diagram represents a typical shear force diagram for a simply support beam with a uniformly distributed load acting. Like this for any kind of beam for any type of load acting one can plot or one can understand one can plot the variation of the bending moment and shear force along the length of the beam. In other words, a beam is a member structural member subjected to bending moment and shear force. Every cross section of the beam is going to be subjected to bending moment and shear force. Since the whole beam bends, you very well know how it bends. So, since the whole beam bends as you can see in this uh, diagram or in this picture, the beam has bent. So, since this beam bends, it is also known as a flexural member or a bending member. The bending moment is responsible for this bending of the beam. Whenever the beam bends, it is going to cause a bending stress along the longitudinal axis of the beam. In your strength of materials, I think you might have learned this bending equation through which one can calculate the longitudinal bending stress by using the formula F is equal to m into y by i. So, once again explaining the beam to start with, it is a member which supports the transfer slots, transfer slots are the loads perpendicular to the longitudinal axis and these transfer slots causes bending moment and shear force throughout the length of the beam and they are also known as the flexural or bending member. And the other way of recognizing, recognizing the beam is the dimensions. Whenever the length of the beam is very large compared to the width and depth, then you can say that it is a beam. A slab is also a beam, but it is of 1 meter width. This is going to be explained later when we explain about the design of slabs. So, basically the beam and slab are one and the same, but the difference here is a beam has got a very, very small dimension as compared to its length and a beam may be simply supported or continuous. You might have plotted the bending moment diagram, shear force diagram for the simply supported beams subjected to different kinds of loads and also you might have discussed or you might have learnt the meaning of the continuous beam. Whatever the simple diagram I have written here is a simply supported beam. The other diagram which I am going to write is nothing but the continuous beam. So, a continuous beam is the one which has got more than two supports and has got more than two base, at least more than three sorry, more than three supports and two base. For example, if you have or if you consider a 
simple continuous beam you can observe that it has got more than three supports and it has got more than two panels. So, this is the first case of the continuous beam and this is a three span continuous beam. So, a beam may be simply supported or it may be continuous. So, the analysis part of determining the values of the moment that gets developed has been already taught to you in structure analysis 1, where there are several methods like moment distribution method, Connie's method, three moment equation etcetera to determine the values of the bending moment for which you are going to design. So, but anyhow some standard cases like the bending moment of a simply supported beam with UDL everyone knows that it is maximum at the center and its value is WL square by 8. And if you consider a simply supported beam with a concentrated load at the center and if the magnitude of the load acting here is W and if the total span of the beam is L and if this concentrated load is acting at the center then the maximum bending moment is WL by 4 which occurs at the center. Okay. So, like this one can understand the nature of the supports or the different types of beams may be simply supported or it may be continuous. So, this is a figure which explains how the beam bends whenever it is subjected to any kind of load. So, this bending of the beam Q size to longitudinal bending stress for this simple case of simply supported beam with UDL acting throughout the length of the beam, the bottom fibers will be subjected to tension and the top fibers will be subjected to compression. So, there is one layer which neither gets elongated nor it gets compressed nor it gets compressed that layer is known as the neutral layer and the trace of this neutral layer in the cross section is known as the neutral axis. So, from this one can understand that this particular beam which has been shown in the figure is subjected to compressive stresses above the neutral axis and tensile stresses below the neutral axis. So, the typical variation of the bending stress has also been taught to you in your structure analysis where one can just see the stress distribution diagram for a simply supported simply supported beam subjected to UDL. The simply supported beam with UDL, the top fibers will be subjected to compressive stresses and the bottom fibers will be subjected to tensile stresses. So, if you consider a cantilever it becomes reverse. A cantilever subjected to uniformly distributed load, if you take the cross section and try to trace the stresses, then the top fibers will be subjected to tension and the bottom fibers will be subjected to compression. The simple reason for explaining this is, the simple reason for considering these things is to know where the steel has to be placed. Normally, the steel has to be placed in the tension zone. So, if you consider a simply support beam, then you are going to consider, you are going to place the steel in the tension zone here as shown in the bottom zone. Whereas, if you consider a cantilever, then you are going to consider, you are going to place the steel in the top zone leaving some cover. So, that makes the difference between a simply support beam and a cantilever beam. So, whenever we design the beams, you should be thorough or you should know where the tension occurs. So, that is a very, very important thing one has to understand how the tensile stresses develop because you are going to place your steel in the tension zone as been already defined a RCC reinforced cement concrete is a member where the plain concrete is going to be strengthened with the help of the steel. So, whatever the compressive stresses develop is going to be taken up by concrete whereas, the tensile stresses are going to be taken up by the steel. So, as such one should be one should know where the steel has to be placed and where the tension develops. So, this is another beam uh, a beam means 
I am talking about the reinforced cement concrete beam where I have shown the reinforcement cage. Whenever you want to cast a reinforced cement concrete beam, you should fabricate the steel and then further the side forms should be there and you have to pour the concrete in this fabricated steel so that after curing it becomes a beam. So, now we have an inverted beam here normally this is the regular beam which is used where you will be able to see the beams and the beams will be provided below the slab. Whereas, in this beam or in this building the beams are provided above the slab these beams are known as the inverted beams. So, the two types of beams are shown here this is the regular beam whereas, the previous one is the inverted beam. So, this is after curing. So, the steel reinforcement has to be placed properly whatever the design steel has to be provided whatever the design steel is there that has to be provided later on the form work should be ready and you have to pour the concrete. So, once it gets cured it may be a regular beam or it may be a inverted beam. So, you can understand that whatever the slab load is there this is the slab here whatever the load that is getting realized on this slab including the self weight is going to get transferred to the beams further the beams are going to transfer the load to the columns or the walls. Now, coming to the different types of beams we have singly reinforced rectangular beam, doubly reinforced rectangular beam, a singly reinforced T beam, doubly reinforced T beam, a singly reinforced L beam and a doubly reinforced L beam. What is this singly reinforced rectangular beam? So, by the name itself you can understand that the cross section of the beam is rectangle, but more than this the other important thing here is in case of the single reinforced beams the steel is provided in the tension zone only a very very important thing steel if it is provided only in the tension zone as I explained here it is known as a singly reinforced beam. You very well know that the whole beam gets divided into two parts that is the compression zone and the tension zone and if you are providing the steel only in the tension zone then it is going to be called as a singly reinforced beam. No doubt you are going to provide some steel at the compression zone also, but this is not taken into consideration for calculation purposes it is only it only helps as hanger or anchor bars to support the stirrups. Stirrup is a reinforcement provided to take care the shear. So, a single reinforced beam is the beam where the steel is provided in the tension zone only. Next this figure also you can understand that a simple beam a simple support beam has been considered and this beam consists of the compression zone with hanger bars and the tension zone with steel bars in tension. You very well know the you can easily understand the width of the beam as well as the depth of the beam and there is an axis known as the neutral axis which neither will be subjected to compression nor it will be subjected to tension. So, I have taken a very simple case of singly reinforced rectangular beam. Some people they are under the impression that singly reinforced means there is only one bar. It is not correct singly reinforced means one zone is going to be provided with steel. I am going to or we are going to divide this based on the steel provided in different zones. After all we have only two zones one is the compression zone the other is the tension zone. So, if you provide the steel in the tension zone only then it is known as a singly reinforced rectangular beam. Coming to this second type of beam we have a doubly reinforced rectangular beam your steel may be very good in tension, but equally it is good in compression. Concrete 
is good in compression, no doubt about it, but if you compare the strength of the concrete with that of the compressive strength of steel, definitely the compressive strength of steel is very, very large. So, steel is also utilized in strengthening the concrete in compression, means in other words, we are going to provide the steel both in the tension zone as well as in the compression zone. Can observe here the three bars that have been provided here at the top is in the compression zone, whereas here some bars have been provided in the tension zone. So, this particular beam which is rectangular in shape where the steel bars is provided both in the compression zone and the tension zone is known as a doubly reinforced rectangular beam. As usual there is a neutral axis. So, coming to the third type of beam we have a singly reinforced T beam. First of all one should know the meaning of this T beam. What is a T beam? A T beam is the one where the part of the slab acts as the flange of the beam. A part of the slab is going to act as the flange of the beam. So, once again I am going to explain this. T beams where we are going to consider a big hall like this where there are several beams provided at some intervals, the intervals may be equal or unequal. So, this is a simple case of slab and beam. These two beam and slab have been cast, casted monolithically, they have been casted together. So, whenever we have the monolithic construction of the beam and slab, okay, if you take the longitudinal section, you can observe that these are the beams whereas, this is the slab. So, whenever you cast the slab and the beam together monolithically, a part of the slab acts as the flange of the beam a part of the slab acts as the flange of the beam. So, those types of beams where a part of the slab acts as the flange of the beam, where we are going to consider the some part of the slab to act as the flange of the beam, those beams are known as the T beams. So, a T beam typically consists of flanges on both the sides, which can be seen in this diagram on the either side of this beam there are flanges. So, this beam is known as a T beam. Again a T beam may also be may also subjected to tension as well as compression. So, if you take care of the tensile stresses in the tension zone by steel bars and the compressive stresses by the concrete then it is known as a singly reinforced T beam. Once again I will repeat if you take care of the tension or the tensile stresses in the tension zone by steel, then if you take care of the compressive stresses in the compression zone by the concrete. In other words, if you are providing the steel only in the tension zone, only in the tension zone, then it is known as a singly reinforced T beam. So, like in rectangular beam, T beam also has got steel only in the tension zone except the anchor or hanger bars. And one can also know the thickness of this slab which is nothing but the equivalent to the thickness of the flange. Next we have doubly reinforced T beam. Here again we have flanges on either side of the again we have flanges on either side of the beam and also we have the steel bars in compression zone and the steel bars in tension zone. So, whenever we have a T beam one should know about the meaning of the web and the flange. This part is known as the web whereas, the slab part is known as the flange. So, you are going to calculate first of all the effective width of the flange, the width of the slab which is effective in resisting the compression which is going to help the beam 
to take care of the compressive stress is going to be calculated. The IS-456 gives the formula to calculate the value of the effective width of the flange. Further, the slab thickness itself represents the thickness of the flange of this T-beam and we have the web here which has got the depth as well as the width. The overall depth minus the flange depth is known as the web width, uh, web depth. Next, we have the L beams. Again, we have the singly reinforced L beams and doubly reinforced L beams. So, the basic difference here is the flange exists only on one side of the beam. Whereas, in case of the T beams, the flanges were existing on both sides of the beam. But in case of the L beams, we have the flange on only one side, and here again, we may have a singly reinforced L beam or we may have a doubly reinforced L beam. So, the previous slide here or this slide is showing us a singly reinforced L beam. This slide or this figure shows us the doubly reinforced L beam. Basically, an L beam will be subject to torsion which I am going to deal later. So, here in this design of beams, we are going to take care of the bending moment, the torsional moment, the shear. Okay. So, the L beam is basically subjected to torsion. Now, as soon as we, under, as we have understood the beams, we can now go to the general specifications required for flexural design of beams, a very, very important thing. Unless you know the general specifications, you cannot design the beams. Basically, a beam is designed for limit state of collapse. That is, we give importance to the strength of the beam. We design the beam to carry a particular strength. Then further, we check for the other limit states like shear, serviceability, durability, fire, impact, vibration, etcetera. There are several limit states, no doubt about it. But as far as the design of beam is concerned, we are first of all going to design the beam for the limit state of collapse and check only for the two important limit states that is the limit state of shear and the limit state of serviceability. So, it is a very, very important thing. Further, if you require, you can also go for other types of, uh, you can also cover the other limit states, but normally we cover only the limit state of shear and serviceability unless if the structure is very important we cover only this. If it is very important, then we can design for the other limit states. Now, as far as we want all our structures to be safe. So, safety means what? How do you ensure safety? We ensure safety when the resistance developed by the beam to the bending, shear, torsion and axial load, if it is it should be greater than or if it is greater than the developed values at that section. Already I explained every load is going to cause bending moment or it may cause a twisting moment or it may cause a shear or it may be a axial load. Okay. So, whatever the load that you are going to apply finally gets converted into bending, shear and torsion and axial load. These are the developed values because of the external or because of the loads that are getting realized on the beam. For safety, the beam should be capable of resisting this pending shear, torsion and axial load. So, these are the specifications which are very important as far as the design of beams are concerned. So, then the most probable load, it has to be designed for the most unfavorable condition. There are several combinations the normal combination being the dead load and live load. This is a very simple combination of dead load and live load for small buildings where you cannot expect any lateral loads, where there are no lateral loads acting, you can simply design your beam for the combination of dead load and live load. I think Dr. Suresh might have explained different load combinations. Further, do not be under the impression that there are only two loads. There are 
other loads which come under the category lateral loads. Several types of loads are there, but now I am going to discuss only about the lateral loads where we have the earthquake load and the wind load. So, all these combinations are very important and the resistance developed or the bending shear torsion that gets developed because of this worst combination of loads whatever the values that get developed, whatever the values of bending moment, shear force etcetera gets developed because of the worst combination of loads had to be considered and your resistance of the beam should be greater than these developed values at that particular section where you are checking. A very, very important thing. So, this is one of the major specifications whenever we design the beams for the flexural design. So, now coming to the other practical requirements as well as the specifications we have to first of all select the grade of concrete. Selection of grade of concrete is very important. Again the grade of concrete as given in table 2 of IS456 consists of M20, M25, M30 etcetera. So, the selection of grade of concrete is very important. Then the selection of grade of steel, I am going to explain the different grades of concrete available, the different types or grades of steel available later, but right now as far as the general specifications is concerned, you have to know the, you have to first of all select the grade of concrete, select the grade of steel then the size of the beam, the cover to be provided, the spacing of bars. I am going to explain all these things in detail. So, the selection of grade of concrete, the selection of grade of steel, size of the beam, cover, spacing of bars. Unless you know all these details, you cannot design the beam. The practical requirements as well as the general specifications is very important as far as the design of beam is concerned and these are the five important specifications or practical requirements that are necessary for the design of beams. To start with, let us start from the selection of grade of concrete. So, number one, the selection of grade of concrete. See this selection of grade of concrete or whenever you want to select the grade of concrete to be used in the design uh, to be used in the beam whenever you want to select the grade of concrete to be used in the to be used in the beam you are going to first of all know you should know the strength required then deflection if you are expecting large deflection you have to go for a higher grade of concrete if you are expecting large stresses then you have to go for higher grade of concrete. The strength of the concrete speaks something about the grade of concrete or the grade of concrete is expressed in terms of its strength. For example, if you have M20 grade of concrete, you should know that M20 grade of concrete is nothing but it has got 20 MPa strength. In other words, 28 day cube strength, if it is 20, then we call it as M20 grade, but because of the modification in the code if we have to take into consideration the characteristic strength. So, the characteristic strength shall be calculated or shall be calculated based on the cube strength. Just if the cube strength is 20, we cannot accept that concrete as M20 grade concrete. The characteristic strength should be equal to 20, then I am going to call that particular grade of concrete, particular concrete as M20 grade concrete. So, Professor Suresh might have explained how this characteristic strength has to be calculated. The characteristic strength is denoted by F C K. So, the characteristic strength of concrete F C K is nothing but equal to the mean strength plus 1.64 times the standard deviation. So, one should know the cube strength and one should also know the standard deviation which is also given in the code to be used for a particular grade of concrete 
and then arrive at the value of FCK, whatever the value of FCK is there, that represents the grade of concrete. So, one has to select the grade of concrete and if you require to resist large stresses, then you go for higher grade of concrete. For example, the bottom story of a multi sting, the column of the bottom of story will be subjected to large loads, thereby large stresses will be there. So, in that case, you are going to go for a higher grade of concrete like M30, M35, etc. In precious concrete, where there are large stresses are expected, again we go for higher strength concrete. So, like that, the very first thing which you have to understand is how to select the grade of concrete. Again, if you want to control the deflection, then normally the deflection is controlled by the depth of the section, but however, while selecting the grade of concrete, the deflection should also be kept in view. Now, coming to the durability, see the durability of concrete also plays a very important role. In case of the water tank structures, in case of water tanks, you are going to, you should have large durability. In that case, you are going to select larger grade concrete. So, selection of grade of concrete is very important and your table 5 of the IS 456, if you open this page number 20 of IS 456, in table 5, it gives the details of the grade of concrete to be chosen, where it is based on the environmental conditions. The environment conditions are given in table 2, where it clearly says that for mild environment, a particular grade of concrete like M20 has to be used. For severe conditions of environment, a larger grade of concrete has to be used. All these things have to be kept in view while selecting the grade of concrete. So, one has to refer table 5 and table 2. Table 2 gives the environmental exposure conditions, whereas table 5 gives the grade of concrete to be used for the particular environmental conditions. Next, coming to the selection of type of steel. You very well know that there are three grades of steel. This has been covered in unit 2 while discussing the materials to be used in reinforcement concrete. So, Fe 250, Fe 405, Fe 500, these are the three grades of steel normally available in the market. So, nowadays people have started using Fe 500 grade steel, but for earthquake zones where you expect the structure to be ductile, if you want to impart ductility to the concrete. If you want for giving importance to the ductility, which is very important in earthquake zones, as well as wherever vibrations and impacts are expected, one has to go for Fe 250 steel. Coming to the size of the beam, the very first thing before knowing, before calculating the bending moment, shear force, etcetera, one should know about the method of fixing the size of the beam, how exactly the beam size has to be fixed. Your self weight of the beam is a very, very important factor. So, when you want to calculate the self weight of the beam, you should know the size of the beam. The self weight plus the live load or the load that gets realized, the load that is acting on the beam because of the live load and the self weight are equally important. So, the total load is nothing but equal to the self weight of the beam plus the live load, the contribution from the live load. So, whenever you want to calculate the size of the beam, whenever you want to calculate the self weight of the beam, you should be thorough with the size of the beam. The very first thing which you are going to do is about the size of the beam. So, this I am going to explain in my next class. So, today just I am going to summarize whatever the things I have covered. So, in my summary or in whatever I have covered or it can be summarized like this, number one definition of beams. I have defined what a, what a beam is and then later on I have covered the different types of beams and further the general specifications and practical requirements a part has been covered. So, with this I think we can conclude this session.
So, in the tomorrow's session, I am going to cover the remaining part like the one which is very important as far as specification is concerned and practical requirements. The different specifications and the practical requirements like cover, then how exactly the size of the beam has to be fixed, what should be the cover to be provided, what are the normal widths, what are the normal depths, all these things have to be all these things I am going to cover in my next class and further the cover which is based on table 16 and 16 A, one has to refer this IS 456 to know about the details of the cover to be provided, this is also going to be covered in my next class and the most important thing is about the spacing of bars, I am going to cover how exactly the bars have to be spaced both the horizontal spacing as, the, as well as the vertical spacing is going to be covered in my tomorrow's class and in my summary or in totally I think the same thing holds good for tomorrow also where I will be completely covering this general specifications and practical requirements necessary for the design.